Good evening. My name is G. Trolia, and with me is Pierre Rispo. He's our vice president. He'll be popping maybe in and out of the picture, but he's behind the scenes with Doreen. And uh, tonight, June 20th, we're here to show you some new stuff on the Snap-on scan tool. Now I'm going to shut off the buzzing in the background. I have a battery maintainer on. We're on a 2012 Cadillac in here. We have an associated battery charger on. So this, not charger I should say, this is a maintainer. But I'm going to shut it off just so we don't have that noise in the background. We should be pretty good. And we'll go through this. We're going to cover a lot of stuff tonight. And uh, we come back here to slides. This Snap-on software version 12.4 basically is going to cover all the different Snap-on scan tools from a Solus, a Modus, and a Verus. So it's not going to matter which one you have. Now you may go, well, hold it. There's a newer version that this came out. Well, so right you are. But this is the latest version we have. Uh, Snap-on was kind enough to send it in. Unfortunately, about three, four months ago, we were super busy and couldn't squeeze the webcast in. So uh, tonight it's on. And I should say this before we start, you know, we're working live on this car. Just like in your shop, some things may not work right. I did play with this car today multiple times to make sure it worked, but God only knows how everything goes, right? So with that being said, here's what we're going to cover tonight. We're going to cover scan tool functions. And the scan tool functions basically going into generic or global. We'll show you a couple of things they have on this. Uh, enhanced scan data, meaning we're going to go in to the Cadillac CTS. This is an all-wheel drive, 3.6 uh, direct injected motor that we're on. We're going to look at that enhanced data. We'll also look at bi-directional controls. Bi-directional, what we can turn on, what we can't turn on. Some of their on-offs, how you may get a little confused from it. Graphing, we'll show you how to graph a couple of graphs, up to eight graphs on this tool. Mode 6, big improvement on this one, very big improvement. Mode 6 really is decoded here, quite helpful, although it doesn't always refresh. It takes the last uh, known test. And we'll give you some more. Now, again, we said, does it really matter what scan tool snap on you have but also this will be information that's helpful whether you have a snap on or any other scan tool because we'll talk about some pids we'll throw out some information and of course we need to hear from you so if you have any questions um, you could chat among each other don't type in the question box you should be putting everything in the chat box that way you can chat with someone else chat with us Questions are a little different on this. This is a new system we're currently using. Um, and I'll hook up the Snap-on scan tool now. So we'll see what we have on there. And I will get on to the scan tool in a second. Let me back out of this and get to the main, the main page. So, that being said, here's our main page. And we're going to go in when you turn on your Snap-on scan tool, and you don't have to see me in a picture, I want you to really look at the screen. And this part will be probably a little tough to see, but you've all seen the Snap-on scan tool. The first place to go is we're going to go down to OBD2 Generic. Let me tell you why you want to go here. OBD2 Generic, especially if you have any type any type of problems with DTCs, that's Diagnostic Trouble Codes, and or any drivability problem, I'd like you to check here first. So that's one of the things you'll do. We'll look at OBD2 health checks on our first go around here. So we're gonna click on that. You'll see a nice big screen, so if you're blind like me, maybe that was a little tough to see. This is loading up. Give it a second to load. We're gonna put, if you have keys, you're gonna put the appropriate key in. This is what our unit has. If you have the new ones, there's no keys. So we're gonna hit yes. We're gonna to go to OBD2 code check. 
We're not going to clear any codes. And let me explain, never ever clear codes. You know, I was just asked a question uh, in a class I did up in Massachusetts. I had one guy in the class, he had a problem with a satin, and basically, you know, he thought it had a misfire. It had a misfire code. I said, well, did you save the data? When did the misfire happen? How fast you were going? What was the load? Well, you know what he did? He erased everything. Do not erase, save everything. If you have uh, the Solus, I'm not sure where you can save something on that. The Modus has a card up top. I think the Solus has one as well. Um, Pierre says it does. So you can always save to the CF card. And of course, if you have a Veris, well, it's a computer. You can save it on screen, elsewhere, print it, as well as printing from here. So let's look at codes. There's gonna be no codes in this car. Then the next thing we'd like to do is always go to pending codes. Why? Well, pending codes are something that if you don't address this right now, you have maybe something lurking in the background. The customer gets their car fixed, let's say an EGR code. Now you didn't realize it had an EVAP pending code. You know what's gonna happen next. That's right. You're gonna have that pending code come into a full DTC and the customer's not gonna be that happy. So we'll look at both of them, there's nothing there, and of course there'd be no freeze frame. Um, we can look at readiness monitors. Now this is important, here's another great tip, again, doesn't matter what scan tool you have, could be OTC, could be Joe Schmo brand, could be launch. When you look into readiness, if something is not ready, you're risking the chance when it does become ready for the check engine light to come on. Remember, you cannot set a DTC, a diagnostic trouble code, unless there is a ready on the, the particular monitor. So let's look at it. This is ready since monitors were cleared. And it tells us these first set of monitors, this is just the way to have it, guys. And that's actually the bottom of the list, excuse me. I don't know why they came up with the bottom of the list, but I'll go to the top of the list. It's a very long list here. It says, misfire fuel comprehensive component test completed. Well, those are always ready. In fact, on all state inspections, no one ever looks at those. They do look at the non-continuous monitors, and here's the way Snap-on has it listed. Catalyst, that is supported. Doesn't have a heated cat. EVAP system, test completed. Secondary air, when it says not supported, the vehicle does not have it. No AC, uh, we're not back in the R12 days, and I have not seen that at all, to be honest with you. I have not seen AC system ever. Um, there was talk about EPA maybe mandating R134A to be checked here, because you can see high and low pressure, and if pressure leaked out, you could basically set a code, correct? Now, I'm not sure if they're ever gonna do it, it was just talk. So right now, AC doesn't do anything. O2 sensor, that says test completed, meaning ready. O2 heater, that's also ready, and EGR. So that's the stuff you should look at there. The rest of this you see not supported. I'm not sure what they're looking at here, and it, it really doesn't matter. Look at the first group. That's the important part. Uh, monitors completed this cycle. Let's see what you got in there. This will tell us what tests have run. So you can see misfire, a uh, fuel system was not completed. Catalyst was not completed. So these were all the things that were not completed uh, this particular cycle. It's because I turned the key on. A cycle is a key on, basically an engine running like a drive cycle, key off, wait two minutes, key on. So that's why there's nothing there. So now we're gonna back out of this. Oh, mill status, let's show you the last one. Mill status is important. By the way, I've come across people that have drilled bulbs out, put a picture of the wife, the husband, something else that I don't need to look at, a piece of tape, duct tape, drill the bulb out, you name it, they've done it, including wiring it to the oil pressure switch where the light lights up, and of course when the car starts up, the oil light goes out, and so does the check engine light, but remember you would still fail the test, why? because it would show us if it's commanded on. Notice here, mill status commanded off. Okay, so that's some easy stuff. Now we're gonna get out of 
uh, this particular setup and we're going to go into global OBD2. So that was OBD2 health check. So here's the place that I would go. In all honesty, uh, that health check I probably would never really utilize that. I just wanted to show you that's here on this version. Now it takes a little while to load, just like in your shop. We're going to go to OBD, OBD2 Diagnose, but you should be aware there's a training mode here. And Snap-on has done a great job with putting information in there for training. So let's start communication. It's a 12-volt light-duty vehicle. And I got the key in while we're waiting for it to communicate. Pierre has a question for me. Uh, two questions, actually. First one is, what about Mazda where a crank angle has not been learned? Would a misfire monitor still show ready? Ah, now if you haven't reset the crankshaft relearn, if relearn is not ready on any car, you are not going to be able to pick up any misfire. And by the way, that since it's a monitor that is a continuous monitor misfire, which falls on the crank sensor, it's going to suspend other monitors from running. Now, that varies by vehicle by vehicle. What do I mean? Well, sometimes crankshaft not set, misfire monitor not really ready ready, even though it says ready. Don't be confused by that. What's going to happen? It's going to suspend all the monitors from running on some cars, maybe only a few or one on other vehicles. Second question. And will the generic also pick up a code for a transmission? If she, we should have no codes in the engine, but the mill is still commanded on. Ah, very good. P0700s, P0800s, P0900s, all transmission, and they all fail in inspection tests. They will come up in generic OBD2. You'll get every P0 code. You will not get P1 codes in many cases. You will get some, but you will get all the P0 codes. You probably get P1 or P2 or 3 that relates to an emission related problem. Meaning P1, 2, and 3, half of 3 is generic, half of 3 is manufacturer. All of those codes uh, could show up on the generic end. Okay, so be aware of that. Now we're just going to hit, this is a CAN protocol. We're going to hit yes to continue. And notice here it comes up right away with readiness monitor. And we already looked at this. We're going to see the same exact thing. I'm not going to go through both of them. I'll just click this and show there's the test completed. Next one here, we'll back out of that. We've seen the middle status. We have fast track troubleshooter. Now, when you get into engine, I like this thing. I love troubleshooter because you have code tips. You can put in a particular five digit code. It also tells us here what characters and stuff, B is body, C is chassis, P is powertrain, U is network. So there's information there. We could go down and look at all the different codes here. And I'll just pick one of them like 300. And notice here, it tells us what possible problems there are. This, in my opinion, is very, very helpful to those on the, uh, the other end, meaning someone working on the vehicle, you had a bad day, and sometimes we all have terrible days, right? So it's like having someone in your shop that can walk you through the information. And there's plenty more uh, information in Troubleshooter. I'm sure you guys are all aware of that. Okay, mode one. You've heard about, there's 10 modes of OBD2, believe it or not. Mode 1 is current data, mode 2 is freeze frame. That's something that happens, a snapshot after a DTC has been set. Mode 3 is the current trouble code. Mode 4 is clear emission related data. Now that clears the code, when you clear the code, guess what? It also clears freeze frame. That's like you, you know, a crime scene being washed down with Clorox. You think they're going to find who committed the crime? I don't think so. Okay, so that's mode four. Mode five, that's not on this one because mode five is only used up to a certain year. The year 2000, 2001 sometimes. Mode five is an oxygen sensor test that basically shows you the voltage from the front O2 sensors to the rear and the switching time. Very important information to look at 
And if you don't see that information, oxygen sensor information in mode six, then you go back to mode five. Again, not every vehicle had it. I know a lot of people out there got frustrated when they went into it, but believe me, it's a good way to tell if you got a bad cat or a good cat, being a catalytic converter. Uh, mode six, well, I can't say about mode, not enough about mode six. Mode six is basically the last test the vehicle did to give you information if something passed or failed. You can use this to see if something is full of failing. Uh, you can see that I use this even when a monitor is not running. And that's important to know, because if a monitor is not running, how far off am I from the passing grade? And when I go in, I'll get a little bit more on that when we get into mode six. Mode seven are display test parameters. Mode eight is supposed to be request for onboard bi-directional control, meaning they mandated back in about 2008 for 2009 and 10 vehicles and up that when you were doing an EVAP test, you were able to shut the vet solenoid. It was one bi-directional control that you had in generic. You'll see, I looked at this today, it doesn't work. Uh, this is a 2012 vehicle. Whether GM didn't do it, I didn't put my MDI on it uh, to make sure. Um, or Tech 2, either one will work on this car. Um, I don't know. Uh, mode 9 is the identification. This is the VIN number. Uh, it becomes very, very important, by the way, doing a state inspection. But besides that, when you go to reprogram this car, this information is very, very important. You, sometimes if you get a used PCM, uh, not all vehicles can handle that, but many can a used PCM or a new PCM, you need to program in that information. Um, the in-use uh, performance tracking is basically just a part of mode nine. They basically go through three different mode nines here. Oh, they did give us permanent hexadecimal zero A or mode 10 is permanent trouble codes. And we'll look at that. Permanent trouble codes, Two ways of looking at this, the way it was defined by SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, is if there was a problem, it was supposed to lock in and stay there until that particular problem was solved and it would erase it over a period of time. Why? Because sometimes you could pass it on one end, meaning temporarily, but in the long run, if this thing doesn't keep passing mode six tests, that would stay in on mode 10. And again, that's defined a couple of different ways depending where you read it or how you view it. So let's go look at mode one first. Mode one, and you remember when you go in generic, it's a lot simpler to do. There's not a gazillion of one heads. There's information that comes up in the same format for every car. So if I'm looking at fuel trim, which I like to look at, well, you may see, you may not see that word on a BMW, you may see adaptation, okay, and same on a Porsche and stuff. And Chrysler plays with a different name, and companies use different stuff. Well, you need to be aware of that. Here, everything is the same. So we go down the list, we have the first one, engine one, absolute throttle, what percentage it's out, and why you have different percentage of throttle, because you have electronic throttle. There's a redundancy since there is no cable that is hardwired. Um, we have accelerator pedal positions. Again, that's an up and down on that. Fuel system one and two, says not used, I don't know why. Ambient temperature, 91 degrees. I don't know about that. Uh, intake uh, air temperature 122. Oh, probably near under the hood, this car was run. Uh, airflow rate zero grams. Yeah, we would be worried since this is a 36 and we'll start it up to look at that in a minute. Intake map is 29.2. Uh, That's basically barometric. And you see the barrel? You better have the right barrel reading or everything is off. And most people think they're always going to get a code for something. Let me warn you on barometric pressure, that's not the case because we could go from low altitude to high, so please keep that in mind. Ignition time in advance, there's our short-term fuel trim. 
Short term fuel trim means it's happening now. Long term fuel trim happened over the period of time. And you notice there's two banks there. O2 voltage and another short term fuel trim in percentage. Look at the uh, O2 sensor voltage there, 1 volt, 275 millivolts. And we see a bunch of the catalytic converted temperature, 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, by the way, this is an inferred value. There's not a temperature sensor in the catalytic converter. There are some things that companies do to see if there's an issue. Uh, it's just like some of the stuff, BMW had problems with catalytic converters. And since we have Mr. Pierre, the BMW master, you know, looking at their mass airflow rate when they started cutting injectors and um, injectors and ignition off, coil on plug, how did they come up with this information? They would see that grams of air going through weren't the same, especially if we're on a V motor as the other side, and we can go into a fail-safe type of mode to save that car to get it from point A to point B. We have just a, no, there's no more uh, comments from there, but I wanted to add to that. Please. You have to look at this data, no matter what brand it is, and really think about what they're telling you. Um, and for example, if you have a, a map and a barrel uh, that are not identical on a cold engine before you start it like this, key on engine off, you should really pretty much go no further until you fix that. Yeah, in fact, let's go back to that. Is that and, and it should be a logical number. 29.92 is a standard atmosphere. We have 29.2, which means the atmospheric pressure is a hair low here today. Uh, but those are identical. They're the same, so that's good. But if, and I just went into graph so we can look at, uh, I'm going to have to go down. I want to pull up the barrel. Of course, the blind man I am. Uh, well, uh, he's right there, barrel and map intake. I'll put it up top, and you know maybe what we'll do, uh, we'll just highlight that here. They're right near each other. Let me start the vehicle up so you can see the difference. There you go. There we go. So, there you go. That's what happens when you do things live. Hey, we said something screw up. Something stupid and simple. Yep. Okay, so let's look at the barometric pressure. Notice how that stayed the same, but look at the map. The map now is down, you can see in the middle of the graph. Here's our map. Notice we went down, and you may go, hold it. That's only 12 or 14 inches. The rule is, you, you subtract map minus barrow gives you the actual vacuum. So we can see that, and we can see how trims and everything already changed. So just some simple stuff there. I'll just reach in and shut the car off. I don't need to put my foot on the brake for that one, do I? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just started in this business. What do I? Have? <laughs> anyway, let's go back to a uh, a text looking at it here, going down. So we were pretty far down the list here. Catalyst temperature we did. Yeah, but look, look now how high it is after running just a minute or two. It's showing 703 degrees where it was 180 something before. Took that little time. Oh, the catalyst, yes. The catalyst. Yep. It'll warm up, but this is a calculation based off lean rich changing back and forth. Again, there's no temperature sensor there. It was sort of like how Chrysler did the inferred battery temperature sensor on the old ones and basically how your Medtronics or any conductive resistance battery charger really works. It's not really looking at real amps, right? It's doing a voltage check and it's doing a calculation. So we can see fuel pressure, the uh, 63 PSI right there, fuel rail pressure, a little bit different, 698.9 PSI. That's because this vehicle has direct injection. And calculated load, absolute value. You know, one of the good things with calculated load is if we actually take a look at this, we could see if we have a clogged intake, possible clogged exhaust, 
And <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm going to do is actually pull that graph up. And this is version 12.4, and it's doing a damn good job. But again, we're in generic right now. Yes. Okay, so I have calculated load and absolute value. I got the e-brake on the car, the wheels shut. Let's see what happens when I give this thing a sawed up and a pedal load up. So a good calculated load would be 90%. be able to do it here. You really need to do it on a dyno or on a rotor that would have to run it. Well, you actually got 87.1%. Look at that. Okay. Now, that would tell me that we're getting enough airflow. I have no major problems with the vehicle. The other thing we can look at here while I have this up is I believe we had somewhere up front the uh, mass airflow sensor, grams per second. So let's take a peek at that. There's a comment, One somebody thought that the PID sampling was uh, slow on this. I think that's because we have a lot of PIDs up, up. We have all of them, right? We haven't selected yeah, We have them all selected up. Yeah. You should, when doing that, that's a very good point. When you select PIDs, you should never select more than six. The data rate for all that information to come in Slows it up. We're just giving you an example here. The best way to test that, by the way, is really driving down the road. So you can see what happened to long term fuel trim there as I'm going through. And I don't see that MAP sensor. It should be in order. While he's looking for that, I'd like to make a comment on load or throttle stuff. There are cars that will not allow you to open the throttle past some preset number. If your foot's on the brake, um, they don't, they, you know, they won't allow you to do that. They go into a fail-safe protective mode so you can't accidentally accelerate uh, if you're really trying to stop. Um, and that's why Jerry said the best way is going down the road. You step on the gas and then you're not on the brake, then you'll get the real deal. Right, and I'm looking for that grams per second where it was. It was near the top. So as you can see, there's an awful lot of PIDs here. And this is just generic. And this is just generic. If you get into enhanced, there's a lot of other stuff. Now, not every manufacturer gives you the much in enhanced or anything. In some and case. there's our grams, our grams of 4.43. If we go back to graphing it, Now the general rule on grams per second is whatever your displacement is in liters, it should be about that at idle. At idle, correct. And if you race it up, this it's up the other way. Yeah, then it can then it can go up very high, especially in a in a uh, a turbocharged or supercharged engine. Yeah, that'll make a big a big difference. Now. Whenever you're looking at these pits, you really have to uh, figure out exactly what you're looking at. If, if you there's have a fuel there's problem, there's our airflow rate right there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. If you have a fuel problem, you're not really looking at misfires necessarily as a direct thing. You're going to be looking at things like uh, fuel pressure or even grams per second to see if it's calling for the fuel. Right. And let's now look at that. It's what the third one up on the screen there, Pierre. Uh, airflow grams per second, that's correct. Okay, so I'm going to race it up. Right and we're going to cut out. That's the max. That's the max. The car out the lap. That's all your new vehicles will do that. If this was an older car, we could get up there. But we could see how that went up. And that's, that's important. You should be, again, at least one gram per liter. So there's some stuff there, we're gonna get out of that. Now while he's doing that, so what they do is they're limiting the possibility of you over revving the engine sitting there. Um, they don't want them to just wind up like that free. 
They, they limit that throttle opening. Okay, and let's look at mode two. There's no freeze frame, but you should go in to double check. Here's something that I want to warn you about. Sometimes you're going to have no DTCs, no pending DTCs, but yet you may have a freeze frame. Some manufacturers don't play by the books all the time, so you need to go in and see that. The next thing we need to go through here, come on, stop communicating, get back, is display trouble codes. We already seen that, we know there's none, I'm not going in there. Same with co um, clear codes. But let's go into mode six, okay? Here's mode six and snap on, I, I get a lot of people that have complained uh, when I've been doing classes or brought their unit in. You know, you always need to update your software. That's important because they did a big thing here. Look at this, it says OBD mid monitor ID 01 is an O2 sensor, bank one, sensor one. Let's click on it. Now it's gonna come up with the data and this is big because my last version on this did not give us mode six. Now it says this is a non-continuous monitor results, bank one, sensor one, O2 sensor monitor ready, yes. O2 monitor cycle enabled, yes. O2 cycle monitor complete. No, it didn't complete the last time. But the big thing for you to look at is this information right here that I'm going to put up top. Well, as far as top I can go. Is where basically it says it passed. You have a test ID 01, a value of 0.387, a minimum of 0.387, and a max. So it had to be on the money for this particular one. I'll show you a different one. This is a poor example that I just picked. But basically, you see where we go down and it tells us it passed? That's the key. If it failed, it means the last time that the vehicle's PCM went and got, who's there? Well, guess what? It didn't pass and it failed. If it fails enough times, fails mode six enough times, goes into a pending code. Fails pending codes two to three times, depending on the manufacturer, usually two, goes into a DTC. And if the monitor don't run, let's say your monitor for the O2 sensor here was not ready, you look in mode six and keep seeing it failing and failing and failing, you need to get on the car and diagnose the circuit. Look in all data and go through the wiring and whatever and figure it out what's wrong with it. Okay. I'm gonna go down, let's pull an EVAP monitor of 20 thousandths. So let's look what this thing did the last time it checked. There's a question, uh, is this drive by wire? Yes, it is. Yes, this is drive by wire, very good. That's why the throttle won't accelerate past some level while it's in the bay. Right. And where it said cycle enabled and cycle completed, if it's not enabled, that means some enabling criteria was not met. That is correct. Very good, Pierre. Enabling criteria is a set of conditions that must be met, whether it, whether it be temperature, in most cases temperature, engine load, engine speed, maybe VSS, cooling temperature, intake temperature, outside ambient temperature. But let's take a look at this one here. This particular setup, you see it passed a maximum value of 0 0.500, the minimum was zero, it had a value of zero. And then if you look at the next test underneath, a value of 0 0.012, a minimum of zero, and a max of 0 0.727 in the past, meaning it's in between those numbers. So this is good information and hats off to snap on for decoding this because many guys were pulling their hair out of their head with this. And look, the list is pretty extensive here. And again, we're in generic, everyone. Let's look at misfire data. I'll go into cylinder number one. This is the last time the vehicle ran the test. Now, one shortcoming of this is this information was the last test. It's not doing this updated. There are different scan tools out there that do that. There are four on the market. One happens to be OTC, two happens to be eScan, that's the Automotive Test Solution tool. Uh, Jay Horak just did that with his tool, Auto Ingenuity, and the fourth tool is Ease. And I think now G-Scan, I haven't done myself, but G-Scan, I heard, does it as well. So hopefully Snap-on puts a refresh button or a constant update. If you don't have that, like this tool does it, I would need to back out of mode six, drive the vehicle, 
or have someone else drive it unless you like banging into something, and of course go back in and see if there's a difference. What difference am I speaking about? I'm speaking about the difference of what the value was. So when we look at this, here's the value. If this value was too high and there were three misfire counts on this in the last 10 drive cycles, okay, if you didn't see that change, then you know it didn't update. So you need to basically go and back out of mode six. So there's a lot of good info here. You can see how extensive the list is. Pretty damn nice. Mode seven, DTCs detected during the last drive cycle. Now let's see if there's nothing that's good. And these are things for you to check. If you don't want comebacks, you know, the check engine light or mill malfunction indicator is really the use suck light. You suck if that light comes on, that customer's coming back and they're gonna be pretty ticked off and you know how that feels when you're trying to get out on a Saturday night or something or a Friday night. Now here's the onboard test results uh, to basically do bi-directional, okay? And it says test the component is not supported by this controller. Now, that may be true um, or it may not be true. I don't know. I'd have to look with, uh, I'm going to say it most likely is. This is, uh, even though it's a 2012 car, it's not on the latest GM platform. A Tech 2 could operate on this car. Um, on other vehicles like my Chevy Volt, uh, Camaros, uh, some other vehicles, you need the MDI. That's their new scan tool. Uh, read VIN. This basically tells us, you know, you're going to have the vehicle identification number. Important to match it up. Oh, let me go over to my car. Oh, crap. My car must have been stolen. I don't know. No, I'm only kidding. It has the same VIN, the last digit, 308. And look at that, 308 matches right up. So I'd like to make a comment here, guys. If in some vehicles, they're only reading it off of, say, the engine computer. If you put a different engine computer in out of a used vehicle, you go for a state inspection and the VIN doesn't match the car, they might get really upset with you. Someone's coming to pay you a visit. We mentioned that earlier. Very good, Pierre, for bringing it back up. Calibration identification. Now, this is important because if you go to gmcalid.com, you go on their website and punch in these numbers, Notice there's a lot of different calibrations here, but you would punch them in and see if there's any later calibrations for this car. Uh, on this particular unit here, Snap-on does sell the DrewTech device, a J2534 box that you can use to program the vehicle or go through your MDI or your Tech to Win or Tech 2 unit. Uh, let's get out of that. Uh, a CVN, a calibration VIN. There's more information there. And look, you know, they give you a whole bunch of information. Sometimes you may need to know that. I don't know what this ECU information is here. Basically stuff, engine com computer, tranny computer, it's decoding it. So E hexadecimal or dollar sign E8, anytime you see that in mode six, that's telling you it's the engine controller. And there's the tranny and the fuel pump and anything else. Engine serial number. Pretty good, I guess, if you're going out and checking something here, if it's there or not, not supported. And exhaust, this I think is not, definitely not for this vehicle. Um, because there is stuff sometimes for diesels in there. So a lot of real good information here. There's all our modes. And this has all been brought to you in generic. This is generic, and please don't forget you can go in and use the demo mode to get more familiar with your tool, whether it be the Solus, the Modus, or the Verus. Do we have any questions there, Peter, before I go on to... Uh, uh, no, domestic? no more questions. No more questions. Boy, you guys are very nice. No questions. Well, hopefully you're getting to see what this tool actually can do. And now we're going to go into the part that a lot of you really want to see. It's the enhanced part of the tool. And again, you see the software in the bottom of the screen. I just want to remind you, we're in version 12.4. This is a 2012 CTS. 
So it's impressive they caught up to date the new version. I understand uh, 13.2 uh, probably has the normal year 2013. So I'm going to pick the Cadillac. We're going to pick the CTS, walk through it. It's loading up. And while it's doing that, you notice on that main screen, this, you know, obviously the tool has other capacities besides a scan tool, a, a meter, a graphing meter, a scope. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, powerful stuff in these tools that we're just doing the scan tool part here right now. Right. And by the way, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel, type in TST Seminars, and we use the modus on a scope type setup. So you can see that there and another modus video a while back. Check that out. So I'm picking a 3.6 um, with the uh, direct injection. Here's all of the controllers they give us on this car. So look at that. That's a bunch of controllers, correct? Whole bunch there. So let's go into engine first. Let's see what we got in engine and how far we get. Make sure if they ask you for the key, you got the right key in there. Here's the data display. Now, they did it similar to the way GM did it. You got engine data, misfire data, evap. If you have a problem that you found in generic or global OBD2, and it happens to be EVAP, guess where we go? We punch into EVAP data, okay? We don't want to see all the stuff that's not super important. We can see here how much fuel's in the tank, what's going on, desired information. All of this information would be useful for us. So now, I'd like to add, you know, guys, a lot of this is common sense, but if you have an EVAP problem and you're, uh, it's not running the monitor, for example, and your fuel level sensors are flaky, that could be it right there. Um, you don't need to go further. Same thing with, uh, you know, if the, if the uh, solenoid's always on for some reason, you have to look for a software problem. You have to look at the data and really think about it. And if you see a scan tool, you know, maybe the car says it has a half a tank of fuel, but the scan tool data, what is being read from the computer, basically tells us you have uh, maybe a full tank or a quarter a tank of fuel. Well, guess what? There's a reason why your monitor is not running. So be careful and look at that. So here's a bunch of PIDs here. And again, the, the list is pretty extensive. Let's go into engine data. Now engine data is gonna give us a very big, oh, it's a Gorski helicopter coming in low. Okay. Just like in your shop, real noises, except we turn the compressor off, we saved it. Anyway, look at all of the different data here that you can actually look at. Similar to what you've seen before, but with a lot more. We got pulse width on bank one, bank two. We have different oxygen sensor voltages. And notice how high that voltage is. One volt, 920 millivolts. That's pretty high. I'm gonna start the vehicle up just so we can look at some of this data. So look at the oxygen sensor voltage now getting down to a normal range that you were looking at. So they're running a little higher voltage on there to see if it's good. And notice it's bouncing back and forth. When we graph it in a second, or you know what, maybe we'll graph stuff now. We'll put four graphs up so it's big enough. Okay, let me go from the top of the list. There's our engine speed. You can see by the peak That he's picking all those out. Obviously, you want to you want to have as few graphs as possible to keep the speed up while it's the sampling rate up. Yeah, and and what we have here, we have our whole list. This happens to be in the complete engine uh, list. Remember, we're on manufacturer side. You can tell where we started it up. This is where it was off, started up, and here is our current idle. Same thing here with desired idle. You can see what happened to the intake air temperature sensor, the coolant sensor. 
So as we're going through... And that number on the left is the current value. That is correct. The red good. number. The number the right on the left of the screen. So here, we're moving up now to math. There's the math sensor. Notice what happened as soon as we started it. We did get a peak there. Notice right below it, math, grams per second, engine load, followed it right up. And notice you had some sort of a TP little blip there too because you have electronic throttle giving you, I didn't put my foot on the pedal, just on the brake. And here's our map, we've seen that before. Let's, there's the injector bolt whip. So you got bank one, bank two, and notice they look a little different. You can see what happened when he first started, not a lot, but look how this one peaked up to two something when this one was a lot lower. And now we're roughly one, two, one, one on both of them. And there's our oxygen sensor. Notice we had the high voltage before, but now we're going, and look at this number, down 80 millivolts up to, uh, looks like uh, about eight, uh, one volt I just seen there. So now about 900 millivolts, excuse me, less than one volt. One volt to zero on the other side and a dot for the one to one. So there's some more information for you. Fuel trim and fuel trim cell. The cell, apparently we're on fuel trim cell number six. That's um, there's different trim of uh, fuel trim cells on every vehicle. Um, if you ever have seen the ATS, the Automotive Test Solution, Bernie makes a whole grid so you can see different blocks of tank pressure. And look at that fuel tank pressure, you know, where it may change. And if I want to get the pressure up, I could move the car, you know, flush it back and forth and it should make a difference. So, give it a little shaky here to see if we moved it up a little bit. It kind of looks shaky. But you know, if you were running a car for a long time and that pressure was dropping, 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 you'd have to say, ooh, maybe my uh, vent valve is stuck shut or blocked with something. That's right. And boy, does that happen here, doesn't it? Uh, we can see ignition, IAC, I mean going down all of these different pits and look at the fuel pressure sensor in PSI where it started up high, went down low. Fuel rail pressure. So it's doing a pretty nice job here. And by the way, there's no real delay, and I must say, I'm pressing the button, you guys that are familiar with the little pad button, and it's moving very nicely. Now, one of the things that I always look at, if I'm looking at, oops, I love doing that. Um, what I like looking at is going back and looking at by direction like that. Just looking at bi-directional. So when we go down, we can look on this list. This is all of the controller list. But let's do some bi-directional stuff. And while he's getting that up, uh, you know, bi-directional is not controlled by your scan tool. I mean, you're using it, but the only way you have bi-directional control is if the manufacturer of that vehicle enabled it. Now that is correct here. That, that is right on the money. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to do this functional test. And you can see, since this has variable valve timing, it has crank variation learned, the uh, cam actuator test, automatic balance. Let's see what happens with that. Let's listen to the motor. Let's try this. We're in park, nothing's on. We're going to make sure the AC is off and doesn't like when it's on. That's a little off. And now basically, why would you use this test? And you can hear it. 
a walk over here and what it's doing is a, is basically telling you what the contribution of each cylinder is. So you can actually hear this thing now. It's cutting each cylinder out to tell us what the information, if it's working. This is a great test to do. And we'll look back up on the screen here. You can see it says testing, not tested, and it's going to give us results when it's done. So this bi-directional actually works real well so far. And look at that. Fuel injector one dropped 47 in PSI 51, 52, 51, 54, 53. Well, they may not exactly be on, and I'm going to tell you something. You're going to see something here in enhanced mode six. Remember regular mode six told us we have some misfires? You notice the odd man out is fuel injected drop number one. And guess what? I could feel a little rumble. I just put some Tecron in, run right Tecron today, because this thing has about 12,000 miles on it. I notice about every 3,000 miles with direct injection, it seems to start giving you that little thump up. Okay. So we're going to take a look at more information now, but that kind of confirms what I thought that something is not in the bowl game. It's the lowest one there, isn't it? Everything is 51 and above. So let's get out of that test. Let's look at output controls, or even power balance. I don't know if it'll do. Let's see if it does this power balance test. Oh yeah, there you go. It's, it's going up there. And I want you to look at this terminology. Injector one disabled, yes or no? Well, I have it on yes, but that means no. And that means no. <laughs> Great. And now if I hit no, it went back. Uh, believe me, I don't really get it. It's when they get stuff messed up. So you can do that for each one of these, and I'm not going to do it for every one. I will back right out of that as soon as I can. So there's number two. And you notice, I want you to look at the right the yes up in the corner here. Even though I'm on no, yes, watch what happens when I go the other way. Now you see no. When I'm on yes, it says no. So the, the item on the right of the screen is the value. It's what's actually happening. And this is you commanding it. Right. And by the way, you know, one of the things with bi-directional control that is very important is do you have the right information underneath? And what do I mean by what do I mean by the right information underneath? The right information underneath. There's all those values down there, down that list. You bet. Now let, let me go down that list. The fingers sometimes hit the wrong button. You know how that goes. So let's go down the list. Now, is idle speed the same as desire? So I'm going to scroll. Right. Is idle speed the same as desire? You may want to look at idle speed, but maybe you want to look at grams per second when you're doing it. Maybe you'd like certain things that you want pulled up. There's nothing more that aggravates me. I'd like to see O2, right? When I come something out, is that going to affect O2? Well, let's look. Now, what you have to do with this is you have to get used to the buttonology. The buttonology sometimes drives you crazy out. Right, right. Um, and so, as with all tools, you have to, you only have so many buttons on this thing, so they had to do, use each button to do multiple things. So let's look at those oxygen sensors there. Bank 1 sensor 1, 820, you notice they're both up high, now I'm going to hit it off, and they didn't move for a while, now you notice them bouncing all over? Now it's in control again. Now it's in control again, so watch, we'll do it again. I want you to look at these pins right here. Watch these, notice they're bouncing around. Okay. 
Here we go. And you notice how that went up high? That's because on that particular disabled number two, we ran that engine lean. And then what happens? It compensates the rest of the cylinders to go rich, and you're going to get a higher reading. Let's look at some other output tests that they have in here. Well, AC relay, compression test. Let's see if the fans come on. Let's do fans to the first. You notice that little warning when it starts. You have to read those warnings. You can't just flip through them. Okay, now like see it says, it's, it says it's on. But now it's going to be on. Look at the right hand part of the yeah. The one on the right is the actual condition, and you can hear it running. Now, you can hear it running. Most of these tests time out. And when these tests time out, when the tests actually time out, you're going to have to back out and go back into it. They do that for safety reasons. But again, off is on. Here's what you need to look at. This just how goes back and forth. That's how goes back and forth. Okay, and there, uh, there's a question in here. Okay. Uh, well, actually, there was a comment before that, uh, it, that it also went into open loop when you did that. That's correct. When you're doing these, some of these activations, it'll, it'll do a strategy, it'll move something. The second one was a uh, question for power balance test. Is it more accurate now? I've heard that it can sometimes tell you the wrong cylinder and mislead you. So you wanted to know if it's more accurate now than it was. Does it, is it possible for it to lead you to the wrong cylinder? As far as the DTCs, I'm sorry. No, 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 as far as the power balance test. You wanted to know if it was leading you, if it was more accurate now. Is it more, well, the power balance on this, the only way really to tell that, I didn't actually confirm this with this tool on this car. I'm assuming it's correct, okay? I would say, you know, in the earlier days, of course, scan tools, it's sometimes even a manufacturer makes a mistake. Yeah, okay. of I would think this is pretty much on the money. That would be, that would be my, my guess to And there's one comment here. A lot of times when it times out, you have a certain amount of time before you can go back into that same bi-directional test, usually 60 seconds. Yeah, that's right. The manufacturer doesn't want you pinging things over and over again, especially some things, uh, you know, you, they, they really don't want you overworking it. There's um, no doubt. They, 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 just in case, like if you were, you know, uh, opening a fuel injector for longer pulse width, they don't want a hydrostatic lock something. They don't want to burn some solenoid out. Remember, things are duty cycled and so on. So they usually time stuff out. That is a, an important thing. So look at this, what they have coming down here. They have a lot of different bi-directional tests. And I just wanted to show you some other stuff in the tool. Um, I'm sure you guys want to look at transmission data, uh, maybe body stuff. We have about a half hour or so or 20 minutes left. So if you want to see something else, uh, please let me know. Oh, this O2 heater reset. You know, while I'm on this, a lot of people make mistakes with this one. They get an O2 heater code, they put a new O2 heater in, and guess what? Oops, sorry, it looks like it's bad. You needed to do a reset. That's something you should look for. Now, what, the reason they're doing that is that old sensor had a change in internal resistance as it aged, and the computer saw that, it was looking at its current draw, and it's ramping it up, and now the new one doesn't do that anymore, and it's not going to function properly. So as with all adaptations, you've, you've got to know that you have resets or relearns that have to be cleared when you change a component. And see what Pierre said, adaptations, reset, relearns, that's really what you have in here. Remember from your Solus or your Modus, you cannot do programming. Or, I'm, I think, yeah, from the Verus as well, you can't do programming, but you can from their separate device. There are two questions. Uh, one was, how does it do compression testing? Well, you know, on this one, I don't think it's going to do it. Let's go back there. 
I don't know how it would do it. Uh, theoretically, it would uh, probably look at, uh, it would probably change uh, power somehow, maybe by fuel or ignition timing, and look at the difference in crank speed. Uh, no, here's so what it says. Here's what this is for. This test is used to set up the engine to perform compression tests. This is good because if the fuel pump injectors and spark are disabled, the throttle will be moved to wide open position. So this is a good way to clean the intake throttle. This is a good way with direct injection not to have tons of fuel going in there. You know what we used to do years back? Disconnect the relay, disconnect plugs and all that. That's what this is for. If we were on a hybrid, it'd be a little different. Right. And answering that, it sounds to me like they're looking at voltage drop. Uh, the, the voltage fat fluctuation of, of at this cylinder. This is the test here. This is, don't confuse this with a compression test like on the Ford IDS. This is not a compression test. Look, I just went into it so you can see. See compression test? I go in. This is basically for you to I'm disable just, stuff to set it up for a compression test. Set up. Remember we used to do block the throttle open? Right, yeah. And you had to disable it. That's what this is. Any right. other questions? Um, all right, uh, it says, don't the O2 reset, uh, doesn't the O2 reset when you clear the codes? No, adaptations oh. do not. Now, adaptations, Pierre brings up a good point. Nine out of ten times, they do not. Uh, here's a good example. You put a new fuel pump in because you had a P0171, lean condition. You clear the code. You think your fuel trim went back to base fuel trim? Nope, it's still up at a higher number. It's going to take time to actually take that off. So, any other questions or comments? Uh, no. Okay, so here's bi-directionals, everyone. You have all these other functional tests there. Let's go back. We don't want to go in generic mode. Well, let's look there. Let's do the generic mode. Oh, they have mode 6 here. So let's look at that mode 6 just quickly again. Let's look at number, number one solar misfire. It looks like the same setup they had in generic. And let's see number one versus number two. Remember this had a problem with the fuel drop? It's 40 something. While well, he's getting that up. There somebody, you go. Has a, somebody has a Toyota question. Let's save that for the end. We'll, so we don't get sidetracked. Yeah. Here's our value of three. Everyone see the value of three? Now, let me go into cylinder number two. Here's cylinder number two. And it shouldn't change from before because it basically needs criteria to run it. And there you go. There's zero. You can see that zero counts. And here's my zero values. Okay. So we can see that, in fact, two different tests, what we did before and what we did now, confirm each other. Good. So let's get out of generic. Let's go into transmission. Let's see what they got here. Our, our buddy tonight, by the way, Wayne Colonna, is doing a webcast. Um, you probably will be able to catch that on the MotorAge channel. Give him another plug. And let's look at transmission. Right. Jerry has to check the key. He is correct. 17. Let's display data. Let's look how much data they give you. Training data. You can see the high lows, the uh, the top. That's the transmission oil temperature. Got a nice amount of data here. You got your pressure control solenoids. Ball converter slip, shift timing. Now, of course, a lot of these things would be more valuable on the road. Yes. Yeah, we're just looking through what we can do. TCC data. It's ball converter clutch. So you can see the status. I have a question here. Yes. Uh, somebody says I may have missed it early earlier, but. Do the Veris Pro and any of the or and or any of these scan tools have an area to decode abbreviations or a glossary of terms? Ah, you know, I think it's somewhere in Troubleshooter. 
I believe it's somewhere in Troubleshooter that does that. Right. Uh, what I like is like the Ford IDS. The Ford IDS, all you do is highlight what's ever there and it'll decode everything for you. But snap on does that a different way. So here's shift data. And here's all our information on shift data. Look at all this. You know, if you're looking at transmission, so some of you guys that are in training shops, this is pretty powerful. And then we get solenoid data. Now, I don't see, uh, I wonder if there's any bi-direction. I have a question here. It's actually on the O2s on the engine. Okay. All of them started up in open loop with a reading of 1.9 or so, then it closed the balls and dropped gradually to below 0.9 and fluctuated. Why was it necessary to keep the initial value above one volt for all four? I'm not the software engineer. I don't know why they did that. I would say they marked the highest one on a graph so you're able to see what the highest number or voltage of pain is. Uh, and, and it may be a health check thing. Oh, oh, why the high uh, on the on the on the O2 oh, system? Yeah, yeah. It's, now, a, it's, a, it's a health check. They're looking at they're putting out a voltage and making sure that it com it's uh, coming through. Oh, I I didn't take it that way. Yes, that's like price the two and a half volts and then goes down to one volt. Right. And uh, somebody added here, it's probably a heater test, but no, this is on the signal uh, voltage, and I think it's really just a health check to make sure the wires are are conducting enough and there's a continuity so that they know that the signal's accurate. Yeah, it could say circuit voltage high or circuit voltage low. So if the voltage was above that to short the power, they could pick it up. They know where that voltage is supposed to be. You know, for years they went with 450 millivolts is probably what you're thinking of. This is just another check that we can use. They have a code menu, and let's see what their functional test on transmission are. Oh, look at that. Automatic transmission light uh, fluid reset. Line pressure. Different solenoids. Tells you it must be off, but this is a good way for you to check. If you go to the computer, PCM slash TCM, you can use an amp clamp and see what's going on. So very good bi-directional stuff. In, and this one here, transmission adapt reset. Well, we know our transmission buddies love this one because after you rebuild one, or sometimes if you're having a problem with a shift, the battery went dead, someone erased all the adaptations, here's a good one to go in and it'll tell you clearing the taps, transmission adaptation function should only be performed after internal repair or replacement of a transmission. And it says refer to the manual. So there is very, very good information here. Looks pretty strong on that. Anti-lock brakes. By the way, if you're ever in the diagnostic link connector with this anti-lock brakes and traction control, when you're in this particular area we're in, you will be disabled. Meaning you'll have regular brakes, but you won't have anti-lock brakes or in many cases traction control. And generally, you'll have lights on on the dash. That just tells you that you're into the module and it's disabled. It's turned itself off for testing purposes. Yeah, many times that will come up. This thing beeps at you. So here's EBS data. And remember, when we're looking at EBS wheel speed data, a lot of times the scan tool will not pick it up as fast as the scope would pick it up. Now, that may not be the scan tool's function, uh, fault or problem. It's a function of the PCM as well as what the scan tool wants to pick up from. And it might be the network in the car, too. Yeah, and here's the thing. You know, since this is on a high-speed C CAN bus, because it breaks, you may run into the uh, issue where they have a program not to pick up past maybe, let's say, under five miles an hour, under four miles an hour, whatever the case may be. But looks like we got a lot of good data here. And to me, this is always important because, you know, running a shop for so many years, there's always things I got stuck in the pants with where you wish it had that information in it. Let's see what it has for bi-direction. 
that's functional class. Automated bleed. Hey, yeah. that's really nice. Yeah, and yeah, output yeah. controls. ABS motor on or off, steering angle sensor. Uh, centering, that's important. Your rate calibration, VES actuator test. Now again, we're not 100% sure all of this works. Uh, sometimes it tells you it does, and sometimes it doesn't work. We'll try one of them. Okay, here's our on is off, off is on. Oh, you hear it. Oh yeah, that's making a noise. Hear that hum? And by the way, it's not me humming, I'm not in the band. <laughs> and it said on, on the right, above yeah. all the other data fields, you know, data items. So it looks like, again, Snap-on did a very good job. If you have this software and think about buying it, to me it looks pretty good, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, we do scan tool shootouts is another thing you should look at where we use a factory tool and compare it against all different other tools with the latest software. We'll have to see if our friends at Snap-on will give us the latest version and uh, we'll hopefully shoot for sometime in July uh, to do a scan tool shootout. Uh, if you let us know what car you'd like it on, I think it may be, we did BMW was the last one we did. Uh, maybe we'll do, I don't know, Chrysler or Toyota or whatever. Uh, there's a question here. Somebody said, uh, I didn't see the VPP sensor in the ABS system. Did I miss it? <clears throat> I wasn't really looking myself. I wasn't looking myself. Um, but probably it was down the menu because we're already past that right here. Okay, let's see. Data, he's looking for brake, brake uh, pedal pressure. This is the whole list. Left, right, pump voltage, left front solenoid command. Maybe this vehicle doesn't have a pressure switch a sensor for that. It may not. Maybe it's using something else. ABS fail, DPR active. It doesn't appear to be there. Doesn't appear to be there. So you may you may be right. And but that probably means the car doesn't actually have one. Yeah, that'd be a big thing for them to miss. Let's look at airbag pretty much every day um, and, and the place I work for now uh, they have this 12.4 software they updated fairly recently um, but I realized after I started using it every day that you, you will develop a strategy if you notice that certain modules use one key and certain modules use another or the, a third key in any particular car you will decide which modules to skip to so you don't have to keep flipping the keys back and forth and that's important because that's a time saver. Now, anything without keys, their newer stuff does not have keys, but we got to go by basically what we While have. he's picking a key, so, uh, uh, there's a question here. Does the motors have the capability to determine if the PCM is defective? I have a no start, good crank, good crank signal, and no fuel pressure. Um, the, the, the tool doesn't say you have a defective computer. You have to use it as a diagnostic aid you have no fuel pressure, you would have to go down that path and see if the fuel pump's being commanded on by the scan tool. And if it says it is, then you'd actually have to start checking with a scope or a voltmeter to see what's actually happening. Right. I mean, what I would look for right away is 99% uh, of the vehicles out there, if you don't have RPM when you're cranking it over, then you have something with a crank a cam sensor type of issue. But he says but good crank signal. He has good crank signal, so, you know, one of the things that we kind of teach in some basic classes, and please don't think it's the wrong way, but it's always a good idea to have a little bottle of propane, those little Coleman bottles, with a little thing like we used to use years back, a little tube or a hose, when we used to set carburetors up, and go into a main vacuum port, like a power booster, just don't forget, like, excuse me, later on, that you have to pump the brakes up once you do start the car. When you flow some propane and you feel like the motor wants to kick and run, then you know you got a fuel issue. And you got to check everything from the fuel pump fuse, relay, pump, the whole nine yards. And by the way, guys, even if you can't reach a vacuum port on some of these engines, it's very tough to do, just find the intake snorkel. The intake snorkel will get that propane into the intake. Yeah. Okay, so now we're looking at 
some data, and we'll look at the screen here. Here's all of the airbag type stuff. Seatbelt indicator, you know, how many times the seatbelt things get messed up or people get junk in them. Primary key data. Primary key valid. There's just deployment resistance data. Here's the loop test. They give, you, they give you really some good information, sensor information, set up new SDM, setting up the primary key in the DCM, that's pretty cool. While that's coming up, uh, somebody asked, uh, he's used the long extension cables also, could that affect the reading? No, these cables, you're, you're allowed to go out so, so many feet with OBD2. Our readings, you know, these all seem to be good. The reason why I did come out, if uh, you look this way, I have this long extension cable coming out of the car, okay? I have this here so I can change the keys because playing change the key game could be a real issue. So I have this nice and easy set up here so I can go through it and that way it wouldn't be as painful as me being stuck in the car. So this cable, by the way, you can even get a Y cable, but be careful if you buy to get a Y cable. I do that for beta testing of different scan pools versus the OE. Uh, don't do bi-directional if you have a Y cable. A Y cable, it goes into your OBD2 connector plug and basically you have two ends to connect up. Uh, body control module, you know, fuel pump, instrument cluster, you know, we got tons of stuff. Keyless entry, tire pressure monitor, transfer case, plus all this all wheel drive. Got to go back to key 17. And, you know, it looks like they really did an excellent job, in my opinion, of getting a lot of information in that seemed like it was missing in the earlier version. And by the way, he's switching keys there. They have S keys and K keys and they use a different plug. So again, when you become familiar with this, you'll find that you, you bundle them. You use the S keys, you know, when you need to. Usually they only use one or the other on a car, but sometimes they mix them up. And look at all this all-wheel drive information for the transfer case. Pretty nice. Now, you know, we're coming near the end. Um, uh, you guys have been chatting with each, other, with, with each other there. But we do want to ask you, is there something you'd like to see right now in the next five minutes before we kind of close this up? We wanted to give you a view of the Snap-on software for version 12.4. And um, if there's nothing else that you'd like to say to shut the car off. Well, while they're typing that, there was a question, but it's been answered. Is there any bi-directional control in the BCM? The answer was yes. And there actually is a fair amount of bi-directional in, in the BCM. It yeah. depends on the year and the model of the car, of course. Right. Now, again, we're on one specific, we're on one specific car. So being on one specific vehicle, that makes all the difference. It's working very well on this GM. You know, we were hoping we were going to get maybe a BMW in or something else to hook it up, but there's only so much you can do in a period of time. We wanted to give you some information that all of you can use out there. We also wanted to give you um, a view of what Snap-on has put in there on version 12.4, from generic all the way up. Perhaps down the road, if uh, some of you guys like this or needed more information, we can do something with a little bit more uh, in-depth information on maybe engine module or training or something else. Any questions, Pierre? The, the Toyota, the there's a Toyota question. The Toyota EVAP system test goes through about 10 steps but doesn't tell you when to go to the next step. How do you know when to go? And uh, the answer is experience. 
try it. Yeah, that's that's kind of tough. You know, a lot of times with generic scan tools, I mean, Snap On, OTC, other brands. Uh, big difference when you use the Toyota Tech Stream and going through different testing. Um, that's a tough one to answer. Like Pierre said, probably knowing your tool the best. You know, for years I used Snap On all the time. It was probably my first tool uh, to pick up. And, you know, then it was a period of time where I used OTC all the time. And then as cars become more complex, I had OTC and Snap On uh, and always kept them up to date. And now, you know, probably the past 10, 15 years, you need a bunch of tools. I have about 27 different scan tools, many of them factory tools. Uh, there's a big difference. You need to pick your poison. In my personal opinion, I believe you need Snap-on or OTC because the information in the tool, like Troubleshooter, uh, those abbreviations to tell you what they mean, um, a lot of the other stuff that you normally would not get from a factory tool. Factory always assumes you went to factory training and guess what? You know the stuff already. So there is a big difference there. Okay. So I'm going to switch this and go through some of the other stuff we just want to tell you real quickly. And we kind of covered all of this here. The graphing is pretty easy to do. Um, again, we have a couple of other videos on Snap-on online. You can take a peek at our YouTube channel. We do want to say TST is a non-for-profit. Our website is tstseminars.org. Uh, check us out on our YouTube channel. Just type in TST Seminars. You may want to punch in, uh, type in TST Seminars space P0171. That'll get you one on Lean Misfire. There's many, many more. We do a bunch of these also with our friends at MotorAge. Uh, Pete will be up here in August from Motor H. Pete Meyer. We'll be doing uh, another webcast for you there. And we bring you these free thanks to sponsors and of course TST membership. We're a 501c3 non-for-profit education approved group. We provide hands-on, not hands-on seminars, live seminars I should say, live seminars in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, and simulcast as well as uh, we do stuff out in uh, California. And we're looking, we're looking to uh, actually spread to other areas and maybe do mini events where we have a couple of different uh, guest instructors out there. But all or any of the help, including membership, we really appreciate. We do accept any donations. Uh, again, Pierre, myself, Doreen, we're doing this here on our own time. We do want to thank Snap-on again for the update, not the tool, the tool is our own on the update, and tell you we will have some webcasts coming up uh, in July. Didn't pick the date yet, look for the email. It will be on the new Genesis Touch. And we may do a few different things there using their lab scope, their TPMS, but we'll definitely walk you through the power of that tool it's a nice tablet, nice setup, and very reasonably priced. And the last thing is, I gotta give myself a plug. This is how I make money. Uh, ATTS, Automotive Technician Training Services. If you want some hands-on classes, whether it be at your location, uh, anywhere in the country, I've traveled everywhere, taught the Marines in Okinawa, Japan, from Alaska to Florida, to France, I've been all over. So there's some information there, but once again, Let's just go backwards here to, whoop, one more back, to TST Technician Service Training. I'd like to thank you. We well, got a question. Okay. A couple of things, okay. actually. Uh, one okay. was, how long are the seminar videos that you pay for? And okay, a, se a seminar video, um, we call those a simulcast. So when we do a Thursday night, because we did Monday in Massachusetts, Tuesday in New Jersey, Wednesday in, I mean, Wednesday in New Jersey, Tuesday was in Connecticut. Uh, Thursday here in New York, when we do that, uh, basically you're seeing exactly what the technician that is sitting here is seeing. So you're in a live presentation where you can chat with the instructor. Uh, you'll have to type it in again uh, in the past. We used voice where people would, you know, just speak it. It gets very, very tough. 
There's too many people trying to speak at one time. So you just type the information in. They're approximately three and a half hours long, sometimes a little longer. And if you go on our full day event, it's eight hours uh, plus, and you usually get two to three instructors. Besides, we'll give you the DVD. All the uh, simulcasts, you can download our newsletter, and you get to download our um, handout for that particular class. Last question. What do I get for membership that I don't get now? Ah, well, you get to keep us going. No, but you do get access to our website that has newsletters about 10 years now, Pierre. Yeah. 10 years of different newsletters. Um, we do have different companies that deal with us. If you want to purchase a tool like some guy in Canada just did. You know, he wanted to get a tool uh, from Bernie. We hook you up with the company and you get a 10 to 12 percent savings at least. Uh, we've done that with many companies in the past. One of them Test Solutions, OTC, uh, Smoke Wizard, uh, Power Probes, you name it. So basically those companies are trying to help, you know, people in the field and they're trying to help a non-for-profit group like us deliver information to you. And you also get discounts on any of our previous seminars that are on DVD. It discounts oh, on anything we have. That's true. So when uh, you wanted to see something, you know, we got a bunch of different people. You'd have to look at our website, tstseminars.org. You want to go back, you get the DVD. We will warn you ahead of time. We're, as you can tell, not professional videographers, okay? You know, we're technicians, instructors. Basically, our job is to give you some decent information. You could understand it. The DVDs play well. We've sold a bunch of them all over to our members, even uh, guys in Israel, Saudi Arabia, our friends in Australia, just about everywhere in the world, and Europe and so on. So you could always go and check those out. We also have discounts on different books. Um, again, please don't forget to go look at, if you want a taste of the big event, uh, you'll see our buddy John Anello doing a nice little piece. We're going to try to get John Anello up here one night for a webcast on his Fisca that he just bought. A nice electric vehicle and uh, maybe run through some stuff on that. We'll see how that goes. Anything else, Pierre, before we say goodbye? Uh, and, uh, some comments, but it's all be, you know between the groups, so no. Well, I'd like to thank you all again. Have a great day and happy birthday to... Uh, to the United States coming up on July 4th. Thank you, and from New York, have a great one.